Hello everyone, welcome to The Logical Fallacy. My name is Sean and welcome to another special video. Today uh, we're going to be reacting to, to Matt Pat, the good old, uh, this time film theory video. And he just released a video uh, today called Netflix is Dying But I Can Save It. I, I don't know how Matt Pat, one man, can save Netflix, a multi-billion dollar, million dollar, uh, not sure how much they make, uh, industry company but the point is he thinks he can do it he's pretty smart so let's see if he is right let's get into this Netflix is dying. Honestly, I agree, but let's get into it. Netflix is tanking. They're raising prices, they're cutting content, and they're doing the unthinkable. Not letting you share your password. But today, I have the that solution. Today, I am gonna single-handedly save I Netflix. I want to my friend's account. Un unreal. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that puts the eye in binge. If you haven't seen it in the news by now, Netflix is in trouble. The beloved video rental service has actually lost subscribers for the first time ever in its really? history. And as a result, wow. its stock price has plummeted down into the pooper, sending it to the lowest Netflix it's been in nearly five years. It is a bloodbath. Now, as the Film Theory guy, I've spent a lot of time on Netflix binging their shows. I went frame by frame through Squid Game. I love me some Stranger Things. I aspire to be YouTube. a judge on Nailed It, and I strongly consider Inside Job to be the new Rick and Morty. Heck, I even watched and rewatched Sabrina the Teenage Witch to search for signs of Mephisto. It's not Mephisto! <laughs> TLDR, I don't want Netflix to go away, but things aren't looking too good. The loyalist of film theorists watching right now might remember an episode I did two years ago shortly after oh, the launch yes, of I Disney+, Plus, all that. about which streaming services I predicted would live, which would die, YouTube. and which would tell their story as a six-hour multi-part documentary. In it, I specifically <laughs> said this about Netflix's chances of winning the streaming wars. The TLDR here is that this date night juggernaut ain't going nowhere, at least until it starts running out of money. But it spends the vast majority of its revenue on new programming, meaning that it has no buffer wow, to survive a few lean years. Out. Now, Netflix has to perform or die. It has to create its own shows that are big hits or else it's gonna fall apart. And when it starts falling apart, it falls apart in a hurry. So Netflix's chances of being the winner here are slow. Lo and behold, that's exactly what we see happening right now. The company is crumbling under the increased pressure from other streaming services and is now desperately searching for solutions. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna say I called it, but you know, I'm just, might just put a plus one over in this column. Anyway, I wanna do my best to help out. So listen up here, uh... Uh, who do I talk to for this one? Hold on, I, I got it, I got it, it's in my papers. CEO of Netflix, Reed Hastings. I Seamless. I that. think I have the solutions to your problem. Okay. Today, MatPat is here to give you 15 minutes of free consulting. We are gonna single-handedly save Netflix. I just Netflix, hope that you, you listen a little uh, bit better than some other people I've tried to help in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars. <clears throat> just saying, they ignored me and uh, look how well it turned out for them. First, let me catch you up. Netflix was founded way back in 1997. As the story goes, founder Reed Hastings got the idea after receiving a $40 fine at Blockbuster for losing the movie Apollo 13. Now, obviously, that's the fun version of the story that they like to tell the press. In reality, it was just business people trying to figure out how to make money by creating the next Amazon. If Amazon is a store shipping goods directly to your house, then what else could be delivered directly to your doorstep? Movies! And thus, the concept was born. The idea was to create a video rental service with no late fees that would ship the still newish format of DVDs through the mail to you, rather than relying on brick and mortar stores. This was fairly successful, but things took a massive turn in 2007 when Netflix began offering the option to stream some of their movies directly through the internet. The standard $5.99 a month disc plan bought subscribers a whopping six hours of streaming per month. Ironically, wouldn't be enough time to actually get through an entire season of a show nowadays. Also, as someone who has subscribed through that era, the selection was slim. Usually just a lousy sequel to a movie while the original remained male only. But you know what? That was all it took. The speed and convenience of streaming became the preferred way to watch. Sure, quality might have been lower when streaming, but sometimes you just need that immediate satisfaction of pumping Bridgerton into your brain. By 2011, Netflix announced production of its first original side. series, House of Cards, which had a budget of $100 million. Fast forward to today when Netflix is launching a new original series practically every day, and a single episode of Stranger Things costs some $30 million to make. Times have certainly changed 
changed. The landscape, That's though, expensive. has also changed. It took him a few years to take streaming seriously, but now entertainment behemoths like Disney and HBO have entered the fray with more production experience, stronger IPs, and deeper libraries, which have allowed them to quickly take a bite out of Netflix's Disney subscriber Netflix numbers. And this, this has IPs resulted in Netflix theory. starting to You're panic. Right. Early in 2022, Netflix made a series of very controversial statements. First off, the price was gonna go up. To a lot of people, this seemed unfair because it wasn't like no, Netflix no. was suddenly offering more than before. In fact, quite contrary. A few weeks later, Netflix said that it would be pulling back on its original content. All of this then culminated in what's probably become Netflix's most infamous announcement, a promise to crack down on password sharing. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I have to make some very awkward phone calls to my mom, and my aunt, and my other aunt, and my aunt's son-in-law. To show you just how bad things are for them right now, Reed Hastings said the company was considering adding a subscription tier that was cheaper, but ad-supported. This is a huge deal since Netflix's whole thing has been not needing ads. In fact, my boy Reed over here would brag about how they were a better service because they didn't need ads. Now, when it comes to solutions, some are easier than others. For instance, solving the password crackdown is easy. Don't. Just don't do it. For almost 15 years now, people have been freely sharing their Netflix passwords. Cracking down now is not the thing that's gonna save you. Password sharing isn't a bug for Netflix, it's a feature. Lots of people think that $10 a month is too much for standard definition quality considering yeah. how much they use Netflix, but they don't mind chipping in with a group of their friends. Heck, with a group of three people, everyone can pay $4 a month and you get high definition content. If Netflix plans to keep increasing its prices regardless of the reason, password sharing is the thing that's gonna protect them from any negative backlash. Plus, yeah. changing your Netflix password on an X is a surprisingly satisfying power move. Just saying, while it might seem like an attractive way to quickly boost the numbers back up, it's a short-term gain at best, as it gets people to question whether they really need this service at all. And it leaves a pretty negative taste in people's mouths for anyone who decides to stick around. It's a move that looks and feels desperate. But let's actually talk about those price increases, shall we? Netflix could have blamed the price increase on the worldwide inflation, but instead they went and said this, quote, we're updating our prices so that we can continue to offer a wide variety of quality entertainment options. So in Netflix's own words, it's the content that's killing them. Except that they also announced that they're cutting back on original content. This implies that original content is becoming far more expensive to make. And yeah, that actually tracks. Amazon Prime just created the most expensive show in TV history, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, which cost an astounding $465 million Gosh, wow. to make. That is over 100 million more than the budget of Avengers Endgame. Disney Plus spent a reported $225 million on WandaVision, and as I mentioned, the final season of Stranger Things is coming in at roughly $270 million. But the He's problem isn't the cost, it's money, what guys. you're doing with the shows once you've spent all that money making them. You ever wonder why I became the analytics guy over here on YouTube? Not only was it because I was a math nerd and I just like numbers, but it was also because these episodes took so darn long to make. A hundred hours all by myself with a full-time job to boot. I needed to make sure that each episode I managed to finish got as many views as possible and could last until my next you. upload, and the analytics yeah, helped me figure out that. how to wring every last view this out really of each video that I produce. And uh, Netflix, guys, you're uh, sloppy uh, about YouTube. this. You see, there are three main types of promotional media. Owned media, paid media, and earned media. Owned media is the promotion that you get from the things that you own. Your YouTube channel, your website, whatever. In the case of Netflix, that big rotating Subscribe. banner when you first log in, that's probably the owned best media. owned media that they have because everyone Subscribe who logs in like sees it. Paid yeah. media is the extra promotion that you get from paying people. TV commercials, ads, influencer campaigns. And let's be honest, Eventually Netflix has been be mismanaging both of these forms of media for a while Eventually. now. Did anyone actually see the Cuphead show when it launched? Because I was excited about it, but I actively had to dig in order to find it on Netflix. Really? Same thing with Arcane, which Netflix says that I have a 97% match for. My friend Colleen, Miranda Sings, literally had a show on Netflix, Haters Back Off, and I had to double check the day that it launched because I didn't see any promotion for it. Those are all failures of owned and paid media. And honestly, it makes sense. When you're launching a new series almost every day, you only have so much promotional budget to go around, so much screen real estate to dedicate to a thumbnail. But that's your problem. You're paying for the content, but you're not promoting it in a way that guarantees that it gets seen so by the people who the want to see it. It's like if Mr. Beast spent millions of dollars on his Squid Game video and then made a title and thumbnail that looked like this. If you can't commit to seeing a show through to its launch, and I mean really giving it your all, then you're just throwing your money away. Save that that's show for problem, later. Guys. Sure, shows like like the it's Mandalorian are riding on the quality. backs of giants, but with nearly 222 million subscribers to their service, it's Netflix can Disney also be a kingmaker here. They can create a hit show out of nothing just by putting something front and center and believing in it enough to let it sit there and be promoted. But you have
have to commit to doing that, and right now you can't because you just have too much stuff coming out. You have to be pickier about what you greenlight, which leads us to the big X factor here that Netflix is missing. It's the third type of media, earned media. That's the stuff that you get for free from people just being inspired to talk about and share what you've done. Now, Netflix, look at where your hundreds of millions of dollars are going. For Lord of the Rings and WandaVision, that money is going directly into merchandisable IP, shows that can show up as t-shirts and Halloween costumes and action figures on store shelves. And well, sure, Stranger Things has some of that. Congratulations, you too can now dress like a normal kid for Halloween. It's one of the few big hits on Netflix actually able to do it. Take a look at Netflix's biggest stars. Squid Game? Sure, sell some pink jumpsuits and PlayStation masks over at the local Spencer's Gifts. Beyond that, though? Uh, remember Bird Box? Huge streaming numbers, but you can't sell an action figure of a monster that's invisible. The documentary series Tiger King? Sure, action figures exist, but are you really gonna want them? And all of their biggest shows are like this. The Queen's Gambit, Bridgerton, 13 Reasons Why. The IP that they're paying to create is watchable. Yeah, but that's it. They don't have legs beyond the screen because Disney. shows like Ozark like and The Crown aren't really IP. built for anything really beyond the screen. Cool. Those Every aren't time. fandoms that are just gonna go out and buy a Jason Bateman plushie. But you know what is? The Mandalorian. You know what looks good on a poster? Grogu. Heck, Baby Yoda is probably the single most important marketing tool that Disney ever created. Oh, Without him, so Disney Plus would be looking very different these days. When I say that Netflix needs things that can live on store shelves, it's not about the money that you make selling a 13 Reasons Why tape player. It's about the show feeling important and staying top of mind. Baby Yoda has earned so much media since he was first introduced as people draw him, ship him, meme him, buy plushies and t-shirts of him. You cannot escape Grogu. To the point where even people who weren't interested just had to get Disney Plus in order to check out the show and see what all the hype was about. It's Netflix show. shows don't have that baked into their formulas. Really they aren't Netflix choosing Netflix. shows that can develop fandoms, and when they do, they aren't doing enough it. to help cultivate those oh, fandoms. Okay. Trusting an algorithm to create show. a show that is a witty, really offbeat, dark comedy Solid like Russian Doll might get you a good show, doll, sure, but it's but not getting you a fandom. That requires a human touch. But that's all just talking about show selection and promotion. There's one last way that Netflix is shooting themselves in the foot and holding back its earned media potential, release schedule. Disney Plus released WandaVision's nine episodes between January and March of 2021. Amazon plans to air one of eight episodes of their Lord of the Rings show per week starting in September and ending in November. Netflix has traditionally dropped a full season of their shows all in one day. In their current nosedive panic, they're actually gonna split the season of Stranger Things. They're releasing half of the new season later this month and the other half at the top of July. But regardless of whether we're talking about one massive dump or a split dump, I think it's costing them. I know, I know, you love binging shows, but what if I told you that you weren't actually liking the experience more? A study done on University of Melbourne students looked at the impact of watching shows, an episode a week, an episode a day, or binged all at once. They found that when binging, you may have a better recollection of individual facts and details linking the episodes, but your overall enjoyment of those episodes decreases. Here's the graph of enjoyment levels. Once a day is at the top there, the highest levels of enjoyment. The blue line on the bottom represents the group that binge watched the show. Clearly, binge watching is lowering your overall enjoyment. One episode a week, right there in the middle, a little bit more standard, and it's still significantly more enjoyable. But why would that be? Well, for one thing, it makes the content feel less disposable. Binging is just that. It feels like junk food. You consume it fast and then you move on. There's no chance to savor something. Compare that to having to wait a week between uploads. One professor associated with the study theorized that there's something of a Christmas morning effect when you have to wait to open your presents. If you're just watching shows in an endless loop, you only activate certain reward centers in your brain. Watching a show releases opiates and cannabinoids that make your brain feel good and tell you to do it again. But opiates and cannabinoids don't represent the entirety of positive hormones in your brain. Anticipatory chemicals such as dopamine get you excited for things to come. Without those reactions, the binge watchers miss out on a large portion of the viewing experience. They don't get time to consider the possible twists, the lingering mysteries, fantasize about possible endings. And while the study doesn't consider this, the bingers in a real world scenario would be missing out on all the social interactions with their friends. You're cutting out your earned media potential at the knees. I mean, just look at this channel. Film Theory alone was able to put out three different WandaVision theories during its run as each week offered a chance to speculate. But Stranger Things? When everything is out there all at once, ready to consume, the best I can do is maybe guess about the next season? The end result is that Netflix gets short spikes of interest, but then a quick loss of interest. Spreading out the release schedule is practically free marketing for any decent show. It's also gonna lower the cost of making new productions because suddenly you need fewer of them. Netflix was somewhat infamous for green lighting lots and lots of shows to fill its schedule. I don't know, five of my friends got Netflix deals. Knowing that its fans are binging through its content, 
Netflix felt a pressure to deliver new content on a constant basis. After all, Squid Game only kept me watching Netflix for about nine hours. What am I gonna do with the other 721 hours in a month? Think critically about my life choices? I'd rather die. If they spread Squid Game out over three months, though, I could fill my time between episodes theorizing about what happens next, who the old guy really is, who was behind it all. That would mean that Netflix suddenly doesn't need to bring out as much content to keep people hooked on their platform. Each customer only needs to gravitate to one show every three months, and that is a huge difference. A slower release schedule allows Netflix more time to focus on individual projects, freeing up both budget and promotional space to create fewer but better shows, and then using all of your powers to promote them and ensure that they're winners, rather than being shuffled off the big front page banner the next day when yet another season of The Circle launches. The time between episodes would allow theorists and other fans to engage with the content, create free advertisement, enhance the experience for the fans, and all of it improves user experience as that study showed. To me, it seems like an obvious choice. It's an easy decision that shouldn't take an enormous amount of time and resources to implement, but could save the company untold millions while also making their customers happier. Then, hopefully Netflix won't be losing their users anymore, and won't have to worry about silly things like cracking down on password sharing. Like I said, I really don't want to have that talk with my Nana. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Nice. Oh my goodness, that was really good. Uh, I loved his thoughts. So one thing that I'll say is I definitely agree with him on a lot of those things. Uh, <sighs> streaming is a complicated thing. It's like cable all over again, literally. You're even calling them the same thing like bundles. Oh, get a bundle. Um, I think it's annoying. Uh, I hate that there's so many of them now. And honestly, half of them I don't care about. I have a Disney Plus subscription. Uh, that's it. I mooch off someone else's Netflix account. Somehow. I guess uh, they didn't crack down on that account. Uh, but I just... One thing that I'll say is, like, that is true. Like, Lock and Key was a show that I watched on Netflix. And it took me... It actually was like something that somebody had to tell me about that wasn't suggested to me, but it was like something that, uh, on Netflix, but I had to like be told about it. And it's actually a really good show. Definitely check it out. Um, once they fix all their issues, you don't, don't support them now. Just subscribe whenever they fixed everything. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for watching me, uh, this with me. Please like, sub subscribe, go watch the original video and subscribe to Film Theory food theory game theory all the theories they're all run by the same guy um which is pretty insane uh feel sorry for that guy he's probably really tired feel very sorry for matt pet he has to do all of these content get that earned and also um those, those different content so please like subscribe comment below what you guys thought of this uh what's your favorite netflix show what's your favorite streaming service list it below you guys have a great rest of your day.